God bless the truth tellers. KL, welcome back. How are you, sir? Hey, it's good to be back, Sean. Appreciate you letting me come on. Well, we're glad to have you. And uh, as you noted to me in an email, based on some of the recent conversations I've been having with really smart people like Rex Freedom and others, private trusts are the answer. Because when Klaus Schwab says, friends, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Well, guess what? They've already implemented that system. We have so much to discuss today because the fall of the Republic and the implementation of our corporate stinking rotten criminal government already happened more than 90 years ago. KL, where would you like to start? Well, again, you've been talking about private trusts are the answers, and I uh, was on your show uh, 18 months ago, told you the same thing. There's two different jurisdictions going on. That's what we talked about in that first episode. Two different courts of law. I just wanted to kind of go over your frustrations and everyone else's frustrations, I'm sure, that's been going on lately. Like in terms of when you were talking about how come there are property taxes? How come there's these assessments in your town that they can just automatically charge you for you know we call it cognitive dissonance where you sit back and go how in the world uh, it, why isn't the federal government obeying the constitution and why don't they follow the courts uh, of, uh where the constitution set up and how can the politicians keep getting away with being so corrupt well today's talk i wanted to kind of give you the answers to all of that wrapped up including uh why in reality you're really not liable for income taxes but we'll get on to that okay yeah that sounds good you can take it away and i do have some of your exhibits prepared to show the audience as we go when i tell you you can flash them up but the first thing 1973 congressional report was written by frank church quote the united states has been in a state of declared national emergency since march 9th 1933 a majority of people have lived all their lives under the emergency rule okay uh, when a citizen is governed by military power, he is not governed by the soldier's code of military law, but he is said to be governed by martial law, and that's what we're under. The zip codes are actually military-designated venues because they came in after 33. Martial law has both civil and criminal jurisdictions. Only under military law does Congress have the statutory authority to combine equity and admiralty maritime law. Go ahead and show that one picture. Uh, exhibit D, as in dog. It's got to do when our founding fathers set this place up. There was two law forms that came over. There was common law everyone talks about, but there was also English uh, equity. And you need to do some homework on English equity. It actually started in the 1340s, which was, you know, a long time ago. Now, equity, I'll get into at one point, but common law, everyone kind of knows it. But that included civil law, admiralty, maritime jurisdictions, because you had the law of the sea, where international trade was going on, then you had the law of the land, or what they called common law, all right? So we started out with two different types of law, all right? Over the years, uh, the common law, at law side, started doing more and more stuff. In 1873 and 75, they kind of merged more things together. They called it the Judici or the Adjudicar Act. The original act under the Constitution was called the Judiciary Act of 1785. But this one comes along in 1873 in England, then 1875 in America. And it brought more things are brought under what we call the at-law side. And then in 33, what they did was they merged the equity and the at-law kind of like under one roof, although they are separate entities. Okay. And it says, look like district, military, territorial jurisdiction, all under one civil action under the authority of the military emergency that started in March 9th. 1933. Okay, so there's two law forms. The at law side is where all lawyers are taught. Lawyers are not taught the exclusive equity side whatsoever. That's why they don't know about it. That's why Todd Callender doesn't know about the equity and how to get into the equity side. But that's where your private citizen is in his rights. That's where your constitutional rights are. On the right hand side in the district territory, you do not have any constitutional rights like alex jones like the president you know, like donald trump is having right now like the jan sixers like the j sixers they're all hired attorney and they're all going in under the at law side all they they don't know how to claim their true constitutional rights and they don't know how to make that claim on the equity side of the law okay and i'll get in how you can get there later at the end all right so 
<clears throat> Headline news, American Journal Society, May 7th, 1996. A judge admits to War Powers Court. Judge Carol Wardell in a traffic case. The defendant refused to enter the bar unless she removed the gold French flag. Judge Wardell stated she will not protect his rights under the War Powers Act of March 9th, 1933, and she wouldn't change the flag. So she is openly admitting in a Gerald Society newsletter that there's this War Powers Act of 33 going on. All right. So the answer is that all of this is happening because we're under martial law and you never knew it. Okay. Since March 1933. You know, FDR was inaugurated on March 4th, 1933, and every president before him was inaugurated on March 4th. But, you know, the funny thing is, Sean, when are the presidents now inaugurated? What date? Do you know? January 20th, right? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, January. So January. But what what in the world happened? Something dramatically had to have happened to change the inauguration of the president of the United States. You have to make that inference. And that's exactly there was a huge, a huge change happened at that time. Now, Saturday, March 4th. Uh, FDR gets inaugurated. I'm going to play a minute and a half or maybe less than that of his speech. And I want you to just listen to a couple things on the speech. Okay, here we go. That the normal balance of executive and legislative authority may be fully equal, fully adequate to meet the unprecedented task before us. But it may be that an unprecedented demand and need for undelayed action may call for temporary departure from that normal balance of public procedure. I am prepared under my constitutional duty to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. These measures or such other measures as the Congress may build out of its experience and wisdom, I shall seek within my constitutional authority to bring to speedy adoption. But in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two clauses, in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power. All right, that's the key. He said, I shall seek within my constitutional authority. In the event the national emergency is still critical, I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the emergency, broad executive power. So he wants to broaden executive to power, to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power as if we were uh, invaded by a foreign foe. All right, so that was Saturday. Now, Mon well, first of all, then Sunday comes, Lord's Day, nothing happens. Monday, March 6th, he declares a national banking emergency. All right, now in the, he, he closes the banks for four days. So Monday through Thursday, he closes the banks. But I'm going to go back in time a little bit. 1913 Federal Reserve Act, you know, the for printing those Federal Reserve notes, they charge a fee. They charge, and if you read the act, it says they charge six percent per annum. You know, six percent times thirty-four trillion dollars now equals about two trillion dollars tax-free that goes to that family or that bank, the people that own that bank. That's all. Yeah, lot. it's a pretty good gig if you can get it. If you can uh, print the money out of thin air and loan it back to the government at six percent interest, that's a pretty good scam they've got going for so many years since nineteen thirteen. By the way, yeah. could you get a little closer to your mic? It's not very loud. And the and the bigger scheme is that the you had we had to pay them every year, not in Federal Reserve notes. We had to put, pay them in gold certificates, okay, which were like as good as gold, which put a drain on our national stock of gold. Okay, so Monday, March sixth, he proclaims. Uh, Proclamation 2039, and that is uh, number B in the year uh, exhibits, okay? So he declares, due to unwarranted withdrawals of gold, whereas these conditions have created a national emergency, all right, that's a copy. It's only one page long. You can easily look this up. You know, it creates the, the, the 
The shortage of gold causes a national emergency. He says it's due to hoarders. Well, that's bull crap, just like always. He blames the American people for hoarding gold. When it's all going to the Federal Reserve, and actually other countries are also cashing in because, you know, they can give a $20 bill, you know, and get an ounce of gold in return. It's still redeemable in gold at that time. So that brings us to Thursday, March 9th. Uh, now, he also presents to Congress what's called the Emergency Banking Relief Act. Now, here's again, you can understand, this happened so many years ago, but it's just as if it happened today. No one was allowed to see the legislation. The Speaker of the House had only one copy. There was 20 minutes of date pro and con, and then they took a vote, and they voted it aye for the emergency. It almost sounds like that kind of stuff still goes on today. So, March 9th, uh, the Emergency Bank and Relief Act, heretofore and hereafter issued by POTUS pursuant to the authority conferred by Section B of the Act of October 16th, 1917. Now, put up Exhibit A is the Proclamation 2040, whereas said national emergency still continues and is necessary to take further measures extending beyond March 9th, 1933, in order to accomplish such purposes. Later down, and the regulations and orders issued thereunder are hereby continued in full force and effect until further proclamation by the president. So, what Frank Church was trying to tell everybody in the 70s is that then and even now we're still under the Proclamation 2040. And only if you read each proclamation and you read this, that only a president can rescind this proclamation. Okay? So, the March, uh, when the Emergency Bank and Relief Act amended the 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act. Now, back in World War I, there was this little known person no one ever heard of who was secretary, assistant secretary to the Navy, who brought forth to Congress this initial Trading with the Enemy Act. And you'll never believe who the person was that was the assistant secretary of the Navy in 1917. It was, drumroll, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm. Isn't that amazing? How in the world did that happen? Anyways, in the Trading with the Enemy Act, there were three or six changes that went on. I'll try to quickly gloss over them, but basically the Trading with the Enemy Act is now imposed inside the ge geographic United States instead of outside. That the president can create agencies to investigate, regulate, or prohibit any financial transaction. The SEC, the FDA, ATF, CIA, F any, all of these executive Government agencies that you see in your lifetime were all created after 33, all unconstitutionally, all under this martial law. And they would all have to close their doors tomorrow if a president would come along and rescind Proclamation 2040. All right. So all banking institutions within the United States were regulated without Congress immediately. All banks. All right. All foreign and domestic transactions of any person within the United States is to be investigated, regulated, or prohibited. So if you think this new cryptocurrency thing is a new thing, they can do it under the old proclamation. Already, They've already put it in place. No, wait. Okay. When you say this cryptocurrency thing, you're talking about a central well, bank digital Fed, currency? With the Fed, if they want to do the Federal Reserve crypto. Yeah. But see, they need people to accept it. They need people yes. to comply. And I know the sheeple people probably will. But there's a growing contingent of people in this country that wants to reject that. I hope so, because like Nancy Reagan said, just say no. Yeah. They have to get you to volunteer for this crap. Okay, It is not mandated under any, any reason. They have to get you to volunteer for it. All right. So military government is that which is established by a commander over an enemy occupied territory. The people are generally left up generally left unmolested in ordinary domestic and business relations. Under our Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, and the Law of Necessity, that's another one to look up, Law of Necessity, one of the absolute international rights of the states is self-preservation. One of these powers is to institute military government if and when you think there is an emergency and if it's needed. Under the American Constitution, Admiralty Maritime is a civil jurisdiction and can be regulated under a military venue. That was never possible before. Okay, the present system of law was not possible. Only under military law can this happen. Okay, it's not constitutional. So, 
Admiralty courts are merely, okay, we did that. Portions of the, and here's why, portions of the Bill of Rights do not apply in admiralty courts. So this is why you see the Constitution not being followed. And if you bring it up, they say, don't ever say those words in my court again. All right, they can roll right over you. It doesn't matter. You have no constitutionally secured rights in their court system. Now, there is a way to, there is remedy. I'll tell you that later, all right? Secondly, occupants are treated as rebels, belligerents, and enemies of the state. The commander has the right to seize property. Remember, this is an emergency as if we were at war. Every state of, like state of Illinois, state of New York, state of Texas, that corporate fiction now become territory. And under the territory, that's a different jurisdiction, a different law form. So this is how they enveloped everything and everyone in 33 to get everything under their rule. Okay. So is it your understanding too? then, I just interviewed somebody who said this to me, uh, I can't remember if it was on the record or off the record, but we're talking about the criminal blue state in which I live and paying taxes to a criminal blue state, because we're going to talk about opting out of this essentially voluntary federal tax system. It is a taxation system without representation. It is, in my view, literal theft. But this person reminded me that the states abdicated themselves to the federal corporate government. So when you just said state of Minnesota, state of Illinois, state of California, those are corporate fictional bodies, are they not? Correct. But the Texas state, the Illinois state, the Wisconsin state, those are not under that jurisdiction. And citizens that want to live under that don't pay taxes, are not liable for income taxes. That's the whole point. And how do you make your state aware of the fact that you will no longer comply with the state of Minnesota or the state of Illinois, state of New York, state of California, and you are going to opt out of paying those taxes? How does one do that? How does one properly address the state in which one lives? Let's just say the normal person works for a corporation, okay? And you, when you fill out a W-4, did you know, according to the instructions, you can claim exempt from federal withholding on a W-4. And you can do it on your state W-4 also. Now, you have to have the correct political status to claim you're exempt, but the problem is, is when you first fill that out, you said you were a U.S. citizen and that you wouldn't let them withhold. You gave that you volunteered and consented to them taking it out. They didn't take it out. They have no right to take it out. You had to give them the permission to do it. Do you see how they deceived you and I? Okay. So there is a way. But you have to, what we call an equity. Again, I'm getting on the other side of the law. You have to give them notice. You have to tell them that you're no longer going to volunteer. You have to tell them that you're exempt. And then give the reasons why. And the biggest reason is you have to have the political status with the government that you're not liable for income taxes in the first place. Okay. And then when you had your guests on about the private trust, private trusts are outside the jurisdiction of the United States. So if you're inside of that trust agreement, that private trust, then again, you're not liable for income taxes in the jurisdiction of the United States. I don't know if that helped or if that was more confusing. No, I think it helps. And uh, for those of us who have uh, headed down the path of forming trusts and private member associations, we are starting to really get this. But, uh, you know, it does get a little confusing, even when you mention a W-4, because typically when you fill out a W-4, say you get a new job and you fill out that W-4 for your employer, to me, that's always a federal form. It, is. it doesn't really. OK, but then how does the state how are we exactly giving permission to the state to okay. also take their their pound of flesh? Back in 1871, when D.C. incorporated itself, became United States, Inc. Then it started forming franchises, state of Wisconsin, state of Illinois, state of Texas. Okay, so if you're liable at the federal level, then you are liable at the state level because they're just franchises, subcorporations of the parent company. Okay, but when you clear up the, the stuff on the federal using the W-4, and that say you're exempt, then you're automatically exempt at the state level also, because they're a sub franchise of the parent corporation. Okay, so once you clear it up on the federal side, it's as if it automatically carries over, because if you actually read your codes and statutes in the states, you're only liable for state income tax if you're liable for federal income tax. 
That that's what you'll find in your state codes. Okay. Okay. So you have to look at it a little outside the box. Well, what makes me liable at the federal level? And then if I'm not, if I can get to where I'm not liable at the federal level, then I'll automatically be not liable at the state level either. Now that's income taxes. We're not talking about property taxes yet or assessment. That's just income taxes. Okay. All right. All right. So a victorious army seizes all public money. Again, if the Federal Reserve notes are theirs. They don't belong to the people. It seizes title to all public property until the occupation is over. So when this happened in March 9th, all property, public hill property, which is your house, was put in a trust. You get the equitable title, which means you get use and possession of the thing. Now, this is the Klaus Schwab thing. All you are is a tenant. You're just running. It's not yours. They keep legal title. And because they have legal title, then they can legally say you got to pay property taxes. you got to pay assessments because the property was put in trust. Okay. In a public trust, you have to get the title and move it from the public trust into a private trust. I hope this is helping that at least you see why the private trusts again are beneficial and that all private trusts are adjudicated in equity. They're not allowed to be adjudicated in their public courtrooms. Okay, say that again. Say that again. I'm tracking with you, but I like to take notes as I go. That's how I learn. So they hold the legal title to our homes and we yes. need to get that legal title out of their jurisdiction. Say what, use your language again. Yes. Uh, well, in a trust, there are two titles, equitable and legal. Legal title is uh, ownership, okay? And then equitable title, the beneficiary has, he has use and possession. Okay, so the titles were split. Remember my, my last talk uh, in the Game of Thrones, the same kind of thing. When the king had title to the land, but he let the peasants run it. All right. Mm -hmm. So they have legal title, which allows them to say you've got to pay property tax. They have legal title to your publicly registered car. That's why you have to pay registration and plates every year. That's why they can tell you you have to have insurance. All you get is equitable title, which is use and possession of the car. It's not your car, just like it's not your house. It's their house. Okay. Okay. So if I have equitable title to my home, let's just, let's just stick with uh, our homes and property taxes. So they've split this, they've rused us, they've uh, scammed us. Okay. So we yeah. sign all these documents and then we realize now after talking to KL that uh, the state holds legal title to your home. You hold equitable title, allowing you use and possession. So it's a lot like the queen and her land, right? Nobody gets to own land in the UK. You're just right. a slave on the queen's land. So right. again, explain to us real slowly, like I'm a kindergartner, how do I start to move to remove legal title of my home from the state's hands and return it to my hands? Well, it's, it's not an easy thing, but you have to claim, first of all, it's in your name, okay? And you have to make a claim with the government that the property is yours. Okay, then you, because it's yours, you have the right to convey it, mo basically move it, transfer it from one uh, trust to another trust. Okay, because right now it's in, in their trust. Okay, they didn't steal it. They're actually it's held in trust for when this emergency is over, they'll give it back to you. That's what they say. But anyways, you have to claim it, convey it, and then you have a deed of conveyance and then a deed of acceptance. Once you can prove to them you have it, the legal and equitable title, then they can take it off the tax rolls. Now, there's Pretty a guy so Ron Gibson that kind of teaches you how to go after the legal title. He uh, sells a book, I think, for eighty dollars. Ron Gibson Land Patent. Uh, if you want to look that up, but he, you know, I'd get the book and at least read on how if you ever want to go down that route. But the other problem is, is when you paid for the property, what did you pay for it with? Well, if it was Federal Reserve notes, that's really an IOU. So if you didn't pay for the property with lawful money, you paid for it with an IOU, do you really deserve the legal title? That's that's another issue. Okay. Well, that's a scam too, isn't it? I mean, obviously most people will come up with a down payment for a home and then the rest of it is just blood money from the bank, the fiat money. And uh, I just saw a thing the other day where it's like even at 6% interest on a home, if you're going to take 30 years to pay it off on a $500,000 mortgage, you end up paying like $1.5 for the home. 
<laughs> because we're all indentured servants to the bank. Right. But again, if you knew equity law, which no one knows, which I do because I study it all the time, there's an equity maximum called the beneficiary is the true owner. So in the equity side of things, that if you're the beneficiary, you really do have legal title to it and you can make a claim for that legal title. I won't get into you know the details exactly why, but if you can, you got to make the claim in the law in the court of equity. You cannot make that claim on their side. Okay, okay. you really do have the title to the land, but you need a piece of paper to prove it to them so they'll remove it out of their system because you're still in. I call it always being in their sandbox. You know what I mean? You're playing by their rules, and you, so you better know the rules to their game. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So commander in chief rules the country with supreme power. This is why the gold fringe is on the flag means gold fringe on the flag. Look it up in army regulation. It means you're being militarily occupied. Okay. It's telling you it's right out in front of your nose. Uh, And that flag is in every courtroom in the United States. One object of military government is to put its great seal on things like the back of a $1 bill. Just turn your $1 bill over and you'll see the Executive 2 President of the United States seal. All right? Now, when you're under military law, they go what's called by the Lieber Code. Now, the Lieber Code was started in 1863 when the South walked out of the House, you know, and they called it sign a day. All right? So since there was no federal government at that point, Lincoln appointed the United States Army to do the duties of the federal government. And at that time, they had already written all of these rules that are called the Lieber Code. Uh, and so, again, as homework, I would tell everybody, to look that up. I'll mention a few of the stuff in the Lieber Code. Martial law is the immediate and direct consequence of occupation. Uh, martial law is suspension of the criminal and civil law of the domestic administration and government as far as military necessity requires this suspension. To save the country is paramount to all other considerations. Uh, all functions of the hostile government, which would be the constitutional, legislative, and executive seats under martial law. Martial law extends to property and persons. Again, your home. I'm trying to tell you, your home, your car, everything is a publicly registered property. Your name is publicly registered when you your birth is registered. Okay? So you're considered booty of war along with the homes, along with all of the cars. And everything, again, is put into a trust And all of it is supposed to be given back to you when this emergency ends. Supposed to be. All right. Uh, Martial law affects chiefly the police and the collection of public revenue and taxes. Yes, all they do is charge and want you to pay to the occupier. What what exhibit are you on? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Well, I'm talking out of my own. Okay. uh, Okay, keep going then. Sorry. The citizen... And natives of a hostile country is thus an enemy and such is subjugated to its hardships. Well, you wouldn't say that's true. A victorious army appropriates all public money, seizes all public movable property, and sequesters it for its own benefit. All the revenues of real property belong to the hostile government or nation. Again, we're talking about your house here and your car. The titles to such real property remain in abeyance, suspension, or in trust during the military occupation. All right. So let's get into maybe a couple solutions. All right. So now you gotta go back in history, you gotta remember your constitution. The three the three powers of the constitution, Article One, Article Two, Article Three, right? Article one, legislative, Article Two is executive, Article Three is judicial. Right now, Article Three, Section Two, Clause One. Let me respond to that for a second. There it is. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity. It's right there in the Constitution. It can handle both forms. Okay, and remember that exhibit that I originally showed you first about those two different kinds of law forms. You've got the at-law side, and you've got the equity that no one knows about. And equity is under Article 3, because it tells you right there that that's what it's under. But when you go into their courtrooms, that's all 
courtrooms that were uh, created by Article One, but they're being run by Article Two. So the military is running these courts. So you might as well think of them as military tribunals. Okay, uh, military district, uh, territorial are all synonyms. Okay, and again, under that form of law, you do not have any constitutionally secured rights. Only in equity do you can claim and have those rights. But you got to know how to get into equity, or your proceedings or paperwork have to reflect you want to be put in the court of equity versus. See, the default level is when you don't put the right thing down, you are automatically put in the at-law side. That's the default level, okay? which, of course, is to their benefit. So you have to know how to do the proceedings. You have to know what to put on the face sheet of the proceeding in order to get you into the other uh, court of law. Okay, So Article Three courts sitting in both constitutionally granted judicial power, civilian due process jurisdiction, and both... Congressionally granted legislative power, emergency war powers, military jurisdiction, depending entirely upon the political status of the party's proceedings, which, again, is what I just said a little while ago. If the parties are U.S. citizens deemed an enemy of the state, the court taking judicial notice of their status, then the emergency war powers, military jurisdiction conferred by Congress on the district courts of the United States by means of Section 17 of the Trading with the Enemy Act, Presently, that's 50 U.S.C. 4316 is invoked. So, again, you can see if you come in claiming you're a U.S. citizen or if you don't say that you're not, the default level is you are. If you don't say you want original jurisdiction, exclusive ed ed equity, you get the default level, the military territorial jurisdiction. Okay. And what's the process for unwinding that? How do you that's claim that you want another, That's a whole other thing. I don't, I'll be honest. That's too lengthy to get into. But it can be done. But do people learn that from you? Yes, that's why I have private students. That's why they come to me. And that's why I got to I, not call out Todd Calendar, but he's trying as best he can. But when he stays on that side, there's no remedy. He hasn't been able to win at that side at all. He does not know because he was not taught in law school how to get into the other side. But it's not just Todd Callender. It's everybody that, uh, and by the way, he's not beholden to the bar. He's actually made that clear to me, believe it or not. So that's a whole nother sidebar. But uh, the uh, it, esteemed attorneys like Robert Barnes, who's somebody who does great work defending Amos Miller, Amos Miller, that uh, Amish farmer targeted by that criminal state of Pennsylvania, uh, merely for producing clean, healthy food for his clients. They tried to shut him down and Robert Barnes defended him successfully. But again, Robert Barnes plays in this same court by these same bar rules. Well, you still can do it in their system, but you got to be very, very smart. OK, when it, you have partial equity, it's called concurrent equity uh, or Roman equity is what we call it. But you can get equity even in their courtrooms. You don't get the exclusive, which means when you're in the exclusive, no lawyers are allowed at all. You go in a room and meet with the judge. He takes his, his black robe off. Okay? Big difference. And you meet in a room. You're not in a courtroom. But you can get what's called concurrent, which means kind of half and half. You can get some equity. You still can do it, but you've got to make the proceedings, the pleadings correct. You've got to know what to say and not to put you in the wrong jurisdiction. So it still can be done. Yes. It's just very difficult. Okay? All right. Uh, that congressional grant of legislative jurisdiction is an emergency war powers military jurisdiction conferred by statute, again, Section 17 of the TWIA, amended by the Emergency Bank and Relief Act, um, for all matters regarding U.S. citizens being a person, association, partnership, or corporation. That means every federal district court has not proceeded under its constitutional judicial power conferred by we the people in Article 3, Section 2. Since the 1938 U.S. Supreme Court case, Erie Railroad versus Union Pacific, decided on April 25th, 1938, and the passing of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure on September 16th, 1938. So this is fairly recent, again, in the last 91 years. Before 1938, you still could get common law equity. And there were two cases, one called the Erie Railroad case and the other one called the Caroline Products case, both in 1938 where common law was basically outlet or outlawed on a federal level. Then they brought in the federal rules of civil procedure, which was all statutory. All right. Before that, 
in court, all everything was governed under the 1912 rules of equity. Okay, so a completely different set of rules were going on in the courtrooms prior to 38, prior to 33. Again, no one seems to, to know this because they're they're just scrubbing our history. I try to find things I could find 10 years ago and I can't find any more. So it's getting harder and harder to find any of this stuff because the powers that be want all of this to, to disappear so you'll never know this or never be able to learn this. Now, so hence, in civil suits, in exclusive equity jurisdiction of the district court, because you can't get it at the district or the circuit, courts of the United States have been merged, hidden, through, uh, hidden though available, for a pre-March 1933 private union state citizen said citizenship status being protected for the last 86 years. So I'm telling you that it's there, it's available, but it's very difficult to know how to get there and in there. All right. Getting your legal title to your land, not your house. You actually want the legal title to your land because the house sits on the land. When you have legal title of the land, you own everything above the soil and below the soil. Okay. They change it to like legal descriptions or parcel ID numbers are, are legal descriptions of the property, not the lawful description. When you apply for a land patent, what you have to do is do what we call the meets and bounds, which is the latitude and longitude of the property, because that's the land we're talking about, not the house. So again, you see how all of the deceit uh, is going on. Uh, I wanted to quote two U.S. Supreme Court cases that back up my claim that the equity Article Three jurisdiction is available. All right, I'm sure you heard of a company named Enron back in the day. There was uh, yeah. they, you know, tried to get out of what they did wrong in a case called Newby versus Enron, 2002. The court or the court, I'm sorry. The court held that federal courts have the equity jurisdiction that was exercised by the English Court of Chancery at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and the enactment of the original Judiciary Act 1789, 1 Stat 73. The, the court further noted that regardless of the merger of the formerly separate courts of law and equity by the federal rules of civil procedure, the substantive principles of courts of chancery remain unaffected. The Supreme Court is telling you it's still there. The Supreme Court can hear territorial jurisdiction cases or they can hear equity cases. All state Supreme Courts can hear both equity and territory military jurisdiction. Article three district and federal courts can see both, but it takes an Article three judge. Now, not all judges are Article three judges. Some are at the beginning, they're called Article one judges. I call it administrative law judge. Okay, and only when they've showed competency and good moral character do they get picked to be an Article Three judge. And then there's a school they go to in, in Reno, Nevada, and then they get taught all of this about the military jurisdiction, so they can see and adjudicate all trust are have to be seen in equity. Okay, so that forces their hand if you can bring in a trust, especially a private trust, into their courtroom then an Article Three court can take over, or if there's an Article Three judge there, he can change the mode of the court into an Article Three, and a different set of rules comes into play. Completely different, okay? Now, there was another case prior to that, Montejo v. Owen. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, giving the opinion of the court, the Constitution of the United States and Acts of Congress recognize and establish the distinction between law and equity. The remedies in the courts of, of the United States are at common law or in equity, not according to the practice of the state courts, but according to the principles of common law and equity as distinguished and defined in that country from which we derive our knowledge and principles. But if the claim is an equitable one, he must proceed according to the rules which the court has prescribed regulating proceedings in equity in the courts of the United States. That's what I've been telling you. Okay. The equitable procedure of the courts of the United States, in that respect, the procedure cannot be conformed to the state practice, overthrowing the whole scheme of the administration of equity in the courts of the United States. The action is not, or is that common law, the defense is substantial in action and equity, and it cannot, because it assumes the guise of an answer or defense under the state's law, escape from the control of the laws of the United States. 
as to the modes of enforcing equitable rights. So, trust. You have to be the beneficiary and claim beneficiary of these trusts. That's the equity, right? The equitable title is in the beneficiary position. You have to make the claim as the beneficiary of the trust that they set up in 33. That's why you deserve your constitutional rights. They're being held in trust for you. This is what they did when they took over. This is why you're kind of left unharmed presently, just in terms of the administration of the government is being done by the military. All right, Article 2 power. You still have remedy. It's just that they hide it, right? And again, hidden means occult. This is the whole thing. It's there for you. It's there for you to learn. This is why I have students. This is why I'm trying to tell you that it's available. You're not really liable for income tax. There's a way to show you how. You're not really liable for all this other stuff. But it's a long road. It's a long process. You have to understand trust. You have to understand that you're the usually the beneficiary and how you have equitable rights, not just legal rights in the in the in their law form. The legal rights belong to the trustee. The trustee is the liable party. So that's why you're liable for your straw man. Even though your house is in the name of the straw man, you agree, you volunteer to be the surety trustee, which means you've got, you're the guy that's got to pay. But if you claim you're the beneficiary, you can say, uh-uh, I'm not the liable party. If somebody else is liable, namely and actually the federal government is the trustee of all of those trusts. So they're actually the liable party. They just get us to volunteer to be the surety or the trustee is what we call it. But you have to make the claim from the beneficiary position of these private trusts. I hope that helps. Well, I could joke and say it's clear as mud, but you know what I think is valuable about this conversation? And of course, we're all, you know, getting bits and pieces of this and taking notes as we go. But uh, the fact that uh, Google is scrubbing the Internet of all truth and real news and information, and they are, you guys can just compare and contrast, and you'll find that what I'm telling you is the truth. Google is not a search engine. It is a filter out the truth engine. And so all of this stuff is going to be impossible to find in the future if people don't take notes and copious notes and study this stuff now and uh, save interviews like this one with KL. You think I have that wrong, KL? Yeah, you should have seen how difficult it was to find that FDR speech. On Google, they had broken it up, that half-hour speech, into five-minute pieces. And they had all the five-minute pieces except for the one I was looking for. I had to go to Bing, and then I had to even search that to finally get the one that I knew was always there. But even then, I could only find it one place. That's how hard they're scrubbing uh, the the knowledge that you need to fix all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Well, look, we don't have to uh, say our goodbyes just yet, but I do want people to know that uh, you do accept students, I guess, anybody that wants to become an expert in this stuff. Well, you can head right over here to, uh, what does that even say? My eyes are bad. What's the name of this URL? Uh, RiceTVX.com slash USB. RiceTVX.com slash USB. And that is Freedom USB. Tell people about this. He came down and filmed me for two days, and we talked over the paperwork. He put it all on copies of what I do on a USB. So if you're a beginner, I suggest you getting the USB and doing a lot of studying. If you're somewhat knowledgeable in studying this kind of stuff, you can always contact me at klfreedom748 at gmail.com. But I really need someone that's at least been studying this or is ready to take steps and change their life in terms of fixing this uh, type of situation. And now last time I got a bunch of requests from the old uh, podcast we did about a quote that was in the congressional record. And they scrubbed it. But I put in this paperwork today uh, a copy of that old paperwork I had from over 10 years ago. So this is another example of this report that I can't find on the Internet. But I'm going to just read you the first line. It says this was done in 1967. A citizen of the United States is a civilly dead entity operating as a co-trustee and co-beneficiary of the PCT, the private constructive SESTA-K trust of the United States, Inc., under the 14th Amendment, which upholds the debt of the USA and the U.S. Inc. So they're telling you that this is, there's a trust going on. I've told you before that the original Constitution is a trust. And now myself and everybody is trying to tell you that the answer is in private trust. So you have to learn about trust law. Okay, this isn't, you can't do it as a U.S. citizen, and there's reasons why you got to undo 
the contracts that put you into their jurisdiction. And because they did this to us, they had to provide remedy. So there's a way out and they'll let you out. Okay. And this is so they don't go to jail. But this is the whole thing that if you learn it, you actually can undo the things. I call it, it can take the rope around your neck off. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you want to be free, you don't want to pay taxes, this is the answer. But you have to learn this stuff. Okay. All right. I think that's a great end quote here. You must undo the contracts which put you in their jurisdiction. Just to recap, tell us the first step. What is the first, what is the very, very first step for anybody listening to whom this is new? What is the very first step? Undo the contracts which put you in their jurisdiction. Thank you for asking that. All right, the very first step is getting a certified copy of your certificate of live birth, which is usually at your county registrar's office. There are some states like Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Oregon where you can only get the short form. But if you can get the long form, you want to get that double authenticated. Now, double authenticated means you have to get it sent to uh, the Secretary of State in your state to get it authenticated. There's a one-page form. It usually costs $5 or $10, very inexpensive. You put, you say you want to use it in the country of Taiwan, which is outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. They'll put a seal on it. You get it back. Then you got to get and send it to the State Department, and they'll do the same thing. Now, I have those forms, and those forms are on the USB also. Now, the reason you want to get that certificate of live birth is this. Okay, You want to be able to present evidence to the IRS that you're a Union State citizen and you're not a U.S. citizen, and you're not liable for income tax, right? Well, what do you have, hopefully, that would be in your possession that with their signature on it that they would accept as evidence? It's the certificate of live birth because when you were born your name was put in a trust they took legal title they gave you equitable title and the evidence of the equitable title that you have possession and use of the name that you were granted at birth is the birth certificate okay uh i'll give you the analogy again the story if you're at the grocery store you're buying stuff you got 21 bags of groceries they only put like a couple things in each bag but when you go home you want to make a ham sandwich and you can't find the bread or the mayonnaise. And you go, oh, I must have forgot it at the store. Sean, what do you have in your possession at home that you could take back to the store to prove there's a bag of groceries behind the desk that is your property? A receipt. A receipt. The receipt, the birth certificate is a receipt that the name is your property. So thus it lets you claim it. It makes you... Proof and evidence that you're the beneficiary of this trust that they set up. And that's the big thing that proves the evidence there's a trust and the evidence that you're the beneficiary of it is they gave you the certificate. They gave you the title to the name, the use of the name. That's the equitable title. So do you understand how important that would bring be to bring into a court of law as evidence? Yeah. So you- and, uh, and let me just back you up here for the audience's sake. You know, we just interviewed... Dr. Diane Kayser, along with Rex Freedom from the freedompeople.org. And Rex told us the exact same thing, guys. I, I'm looking at the notes from that date. W- when was the date? I didn't jot that down. I'm looking at the notes from that very same interview. And Rex said, get a new certified copy of your birth certificate. And you can do so by going to vitalcheck.com, annex that document to get rid of it, to get it out of their control, and then send it to the Secretary of State of the place you were born. Yes. Am I paraphrasing that pretty well? Yeah. To get it authenticated in a jurisdiction outside of theirs. So Taiwan, that's why you said Taiwan. You want to be able to come into court with evidence that you're not in their jurisdiction. That's what you want it for. Okay. That's your evidence. So what better evidence that they has three government witnesses on it, one from the well, actually, county, state, and federal level. Blinken will sign it. Believe it or not, he will sign it for you. So you have three government witnesses that says you're not a U.S. citizen. Thus, you're you're outside of their jurisdiction. Thus, any charge that they brought against you, unless you've harmed person or property, you're not liable under. Mm, I love it. See how that would work to get yourself out. 
you, what you're doing is challenging their impersonal jurisdiction over you. That's what a J6er should do. I'm sorry. Before we even talk about the merits of the case, you've got to prove you have jurisdiction over me in the first place. I'm going to submit this into the evidence. And if you can't within 30 days rebut that evidence, then the case has to be dismissed. What we call abated before it even starts. And you put a motion in that you're challenging jurisdiction and the case can't go anywhere until they prove jurisdiction. Now, I can hand you 20 Supreme Court cases to say the same thing. Once jurisdiction is challenged, the case cannot move forward until the moving party proves it, which would mean the state, until the state can prove they have jurisdiction over you, which they can't because now you've proven they don't, they cannot move on the charges. You see how yeah. all of this plays into each other. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. That really is super helpful. And I know we talked about this in the past, but some of us are slow learners, KL. We yeah. need to hear this and hear it again. And I've started to move forward since we last talked. And I yeah. and I formed a private trust outside of the reach of these people. And now I'm going to do this birth certificate thing. I should have started this immediately. I took a note to start it right after I talked to Rex, and I still haven't done it, but I'm going to get on this today, vitalcheck.com. Get a right. certified copy of your birth certificate. Right. I'm trying to explain how and why you have to do this. This is why, why you can't understand what's going on. And we're under martial law, period. Until you, you have the, you, you know, you're Dorothy. You can click your heels three times together. You've always had the power. You just never knew it. I can tell you that if you just rescinded 2040, the FBI uh, would close her FATF would close, the IRS would have to give you all your money back that you ever paid in because it's all being held in trust. I can show, uh, it's all in the legislative uh, acts. It's being held in abeyance, waiting for the emergency to end. And when it ends, all of the stuff has to be returned and we have to go back to normal. Can you imagine how great that would be? Now, I'm sorry if every federal worker, not every, but most federal workers would lose their job. I'm sorry, but they were never, should have been, uh, hired in the first place. But well, you know what is interesting about that? I saw something yesterday on Twitter, and I should have saved it for this conversation. It was very, very interesting. It was about a two-minute rant about the nature of money and the nature of the printing. And the man's point, he was a young man too, because these Gen Xers are getting real fed up. These Gen Zers are absolutely fed up with this BS system. Uh, they can't make ends meet as it is no matter what education level they have. And uh, that's, you know, Bidenomics at work. But basically he was saying fake money creates fake jobs. And it was a really good point because fake yeah. money, this stuff they print out of thin air is used to bloat the federal government and hire. I mean, what is the number one employer in this country now? I think it's the federal government. I mean, when yeah. you take military and all of these alphabet agencies, I mean, in the government, those big, fat, bloated government, the number one employer is the federal government. And how many of those people do anything all day long? How many of them just sit around and push a pencil to, to collect a check? Yeah, not much. So it's fake not money much. creates fake jobs, creates a fake economy. That was his whole point. I think he's spot on. It's monopoly money. Now, here's how your private trust come into play. You're playing the game of monopoly. Normally, you're playing the game with their game piece. Okay. That's the problem. And when you land on boardwalk with a hotel, you're liable, right? But the rules of the game allow you to create your own game piece. So now you create a private trust to play the game of Monopoly. So when that piece, you're not liable because you're not in their jurisdiction. That's just an analogy of how, okay? Yeah, sir, you broke up there at the end. You said that's just an analogy of what? Say that again. How? the private trust can be used inside of their jurisdiction and how you can stand back in the private and not be in their jurisdiction. Okay. You, use, you create an entity to do that for you. Okay. They created the straw man to do it for you. You're just going to create a private trust yourself and use that, but it's not going to fall under their jurisdiction. Okay. The rules of the game say you can do it. Now, if you want to become a very serious private student of KL, again, what's the best way for people to do that, KL? Uh, KL Freedom 748 at Gmail. Okay, one more time. Your Gmail is what? KL Freedom, F R E E D O M 748 at Gmail. Okay, so people can reach out via email and get in touch with KL directly to ask follow up questions or to actually officially request to become a student of his. 
Yeah. That email, yeah. if I remember to do it, will be below. If I forget, guys, just rewind 15 seconds and listen to it again. One last time. The email is what? Freedom 748 at gmail. Very good. Mail.com. Okay. Our guest has been the one, the only KL, retired medical doctor, truth teller, historian, and uh, patriot, I would say. All right. Thanks so much for being here, friends. I'll remind you every single day for free. Check us out for free to get the antidote to corporate propaganda and all of those mockingbird mainstream media, CNN, MSNBC, CIA lies.